Welcome back to our podcast on solid ground. My name is Joe Boyle and I'm the social media specialist here at Helicon. And I'm joined by our CEO, Jay Silver, as well as our guest, Grant Kraft from Kraft Legal. So Grant, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, well, I'm an attorney that's licensed in the state of Florida. I started off at Stetson Law School and worked among some local area attorneys that were bulldog litigators. And eventually when I started my family, decided to open my own law practice. Uh, with the intention of helping homeowners who've been wrongfully denied or underpaid on their insurance claims. And uh, that practice grew quickly through word of mouth and you know, our results driven work. And I'm proud to say now we've helped thousands of homeowners throughout the state of Florida uh, recover. You know, uh, at this point, it's got to be over 58 million, maybe 100 million. Wow. That range, yeah. That's amazing. You know, we're glad you're here and we appreciate it. And yeah, I was uh, I was super excited to have uh, <laughs> Grant on the sh on the show. Good friend of mine, um, helped thousands of homeowners, and uh, yeah, it's uh, great to have somebody with a vast knowledge of uh, insurance law, not only sinkhole, fire, water, wind, um, you know, you you name it. So uh, great to have on on the show. Whether you're deciding to navigate a claim on your on your own, uh, I think he has a few good good basic tips uh, for that. Um, but also, uh, again, a, a vast knowledge on the insurance side of uh, the law. And, uh, you know, today we're going to dive a little bit into sinkholes and some some other areas. Um, but again, uh, super excited to have him on the show and uh, his expertise today. Yeah, definitely. I appreciate the invite. Uh, this is my first time doing anything like it. So uh, he'll I, do great. Don't worry. Yeah, well, with you all's help, uh, you know, you guys do everything well. So Look right. forward to it. Yeah, so let's get into it. So with our first question, can you provide a brief overview of sinkhole law and its significance for property owners? Well, obviously, the state of Florida um, has sinkholes as an issue, and that's because we're built on limestone. Uh, so as limestone dissolves, um, you know, it can lead to the ground actually falling in, you know, to, uh, you know, and forming holes. Uh, the common misconception is that most sinkholes in Florida aren't, you know, 60 foot or 15 foot uh, catastrophic ground cover collapse issues. Um, you know, those are obviously the ones that make the news, but there's thousands, thousands or millions probably of sinkholes, you know, naturally occurring throughout the state of Florida uh, at any given time. And so uh, the ones, you know, obviously that we see in the news are um, entertaining to a degree, right? Maybe scary. Uh, and so as it relates to real property in Florida, uh, it's definitely a concern that needs to be evaluated, you know, in the purchase of a home or in the event that you notice uh, signs of damage to your home uh, or seawall mm -hmm. or pool, um, you know, and those sorts of things, because there is insurance coverages out there uh, to pay for sinkhole losses. Um, and obviously the most important thing, whether you got sinkhole coverage or not, is to protect your property and your family. And I know that you guys specialize in, in, in that. You know, remediating sinkholes. I think this thing is called on solid ground. Is that? The oh yeah, the, yeah. The it's a podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So getting, it's important. Uh, uh, foundations and uh, homes back on solid ground, whether it's an existing building, you know, home, or we're putting a, a new building on mm -hmm. a, a weak, unstable soil or ground. Yeah. <clears throat> and that's important. Obviously, uh, you know, your site planning and building on mm -hmm. solid ground in Florida requires a lot of special expertise. Uh, you know, and so to the extent you have a natural occurring phenomenon like a sinkhole loss on a home that's been built, you know, back in the 70s or 80s, um, you know, that's one thing. But then there's also issues, you know, relative to uh, new construction and making sure that uh, your investments are protected by using the right people and planning accordingly. Yeah, definitely. So a question for the both of you, I guess I would say, is regarding laws surrounding sinkholes, what is covered and what is not? Because I know it has to deal with organics, expansive clays. Um, things like that. Well, insurance companies are generally going to try to not pay you. You know, that's how they make their money is by mm -hmm. taking the premiums and not paying out. Uh, you know, that just increases profits. Uh, so policies are designed with coverages and exclusions. Um, there's generally two types of policies in Florida. One's an all risk coverage uh, type of policy where um, basically everything's covered unless they can tell you why it's not. And then there's uh, a lesser, normally cheaper type of coverage. Uh, which is a, a, like a perils coverage. And so mm -hmm. it's a delineated perils thing. Uh, with organics, clays, um, those types of things, which can cause visible distress to buildings, um, they're typically not covered. And that's because of the specific policy language that was written into the, mm -hmm. uh, the insurance contract. Okay, interesting. 
Yeah, that's uh, I think on previous episodes we had uh, Greenlee Williams mm-hmm. on the show, David uh, David Greenlee, and uh, that was why they recommend testing um, yeah. to make sure if there are clays or organics, you're either going to have to treat those in sweet or you're going to have to excavate all of those organics or clays out, bring in clean fill dirt, compact, and mm-hmm. then put the structure in place. Because uh, both Grant and I have seen homes that um, – you know, they're undergoing testing for sinkhole, they find clays and the damage to the home can be just as bad or worse um, than sinkhole. You have uh, times of drought where the, the clays will shrink, uh, cause the home to settle. And then you have times of rain when that clay uh, re-moisturizes, it will swell. And you have this constant stress on the building um, during the the different rainy seasons. So uh, important to, to definitely, uh, to test um, to make sure you don't have those in place. And then as Grant mentioned, if there is sinkhole, um, as far as I'm aware, they're they're covered for the ones that you saw in the news that Grant mentioned, they're covered mm-hmm. for the catastrophic ground collapse. Um, but the, uh, you know, and we, and we see most, you know, as Grant mentioned, th- there's good carriers and bad carriers. We see ones that, you know, take, or in our eyes, from our perspective, they take care of the homeowner, do the repair right, but a lot of times they run into situations um, where they may be cutting corners, and it's it's very difficult for the uh, general layman person to to identify whether they're being taken care of. And, yeah, I think whatever Mr. Go. Williams said too about doing testing. I mean that that is very important. Um, you know, it's tangential to always have a second look. Um, you know, whenever a carrier makes a decision, uh, because there's laws out there a lot of people don't know. Like just mm-hmm. because you have organics and clays causing some damage to a home or a portion of a home doesn't mean that there's not a massive sinkhole on the other mm-hmm. side of the home. Mm-hmm. Right. And so you can have multiple factors uh, affecting uh, a piece of property. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's what's called the Sabo Doctrine. So to the extent that there's concurrent causes of uh, factors you know, causing the damage, um, so long as you have one that is covered, um, you know, you might have coverage, even though their mm-hmm. testing shows mm-hmm. it's something that wouldn't be covered. If you hire a firm to do additional testing or a lawyer to do additional mm-hmm. testing, um, which is often done mm-hmm. after a peer review of whatever the insurance carriers, engineers, uh, you know, found, uh, you can sometimes find data that supports a conclusion, you know, mm-hmm. that finds the coverage instead of avoiding it. Yeah, true. So say that would uh, fall into, say somebody in Safety Harbor or Palm Harbor, that's a good point. They're experiencing damage from clays, Mm -hmm. maybe some organics, and uh, they come back, their carrier sees that and they deny them. That's a good point. There may be some underlying sinkhole that they didn't find in their discovery or their testing um, that is also contributing to the problem for what they're covered. Um, And as long as that meets the... uh, the new statute, then they would have have coverage uh, yeah, for that. The, the criteria. So, what should somebody in that in that situation? I'm a homeowner. Um, my testing comes back. I have clays. I'm denied, and I'm looking at a hefty hefty repair bill. I still feel that it's sinkhole because there was a sinkhole on another street over. My neighbor got taken care of, and he also had clays in several soils. What what uh, what do you recommend, Grant, in that that situation? Call Craft Legal seven two seven. So. Yeah, obviously, um, there's a lot of things, you know, homeowners can do. Uh, There's been legislative changes. Some of the most significant relative to the sinkhole industry uh, occurred in 2011, uh, you know, requiring uh, seller people who filed claims to uh, report whether or not a claim has been filed. And if so, if money was paid or not, Um, sellers have to disclose uh, known sinkhole issues. Um, And so there's become a lot more publicly accessible data in the official and public records of the counties that properties are located in where homeowners can go on and look up their own property. They can look up neighboring properties. Um, Jay may discuss it, you know, a little bit more, but yeah, generally, you know, sinkholes occur more prone areas, you know, uh, there's certainly more prone areas for clays and things as well, just as in safety Harbor. But um, I've had denied sinkholes uh, overturned, um, you know, in safety Harbor uh, and, and all throughout the state. Uh, and so, yeah, having more data to evaluate what's really going on uh, is always important. And how yeah. do you how do you get that data? Or well, if the homeowner had to do it on their own, how would they get that? 
well, data. Well, yeah, homeowners can a, look some things up in public records, but yeah. you know, careful how far you go uh, when you file yeah. claims with insurance companies. Like I said, you know, oftentimes they're looking out for you know mm-hmm. their profits, and I'm not saying all of them all mm-hmm. the time, mm-hmm. but um, anything you can say could be used against you, and so. Um, having professionals to evaluate data and present a competing argument, um, is, is important. And when you say that data, are you referring to another engineer or additional well, get, testing additional data testing? Yeah. Or just so public what, record a lot of no, public records is, is just <clears throat> something that homeowner could do to find out if, um, ground stabilization issues are prevalent in their area. Um, we go much deeper than that. No pun intended. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, what we mm-hmm. usually start off with is the peer review of whatever data that the insurance company acquired through uh, whatever testing that they did. And under the Florida statutes, they have to provide that information with you. It's crazy on hurricane claims and stuff like that. We see them trying to hide a lot of what you know their engineers said and reports and things like that. But that's a story for another day. Um, relative to subsidence investigations, uh, they got to give you the reports. They can't claim work product privilege and those sorts of things. So Um, getting that, getting a peer review done by a geologist, you know, well-versed in the study of those borings or, uh, ground pattern, they carriers rarely do GPR, I feel like, but, uh, if they did, you know, the GPR Mm -hmm. data, floor elevation Mm -hmm. surveys, um, are things that we do as well to confirm whether or not structural damage exists in the building, um, which is necessary to trigger coverage for a sinkhole loss. Uh, but additional borings, uh, we see it all the time where insurance companies may only drop, Sometimes they don't even drop any borings, but sometimes they do and they hit limestone at 30 feet and then they go to like 80 feet and don't hit limestone. Mm. Why did we stop there? What was it time to go home, lunch break? Uh, you know, things, you know, you, you got to have a thorough investigation, thorough data. So like I say, no matter what it is, get it in a se- getting a second look by professionals trained, uh, you know, in that particular type of claim uh, or, or in dealing with insurance companies is, is critical. Yeah, that's always important. So how have the sinkhole laws changed since like 10 plus years ago? Um, well, relative to sinkhole law, um, it one of the things was carriers no longer had to offer sinkhole coverage if they provided a premium discount. Um, that was a big lobby effort by insurance companies because they were, you know, sucking mm-hmm. wind from having to pay out on a lot of claims. Uh, you know, relative to the uh, discouraging of homeowners and bringing claims because if there's... Um, uh, a larger deductible as well as what, what got applied to so homeowners are basically out of pocket to fix their own stuff. A lot of times kind of discourages, uh, mm-hmm. you know, homeowners wanting to bring claims uh, in conjunction with uh, in- increasing the threshold for a carrier to have to pay a claim um, by defining a sinkhole loss as being something that's dependent on what we call structural damage. Mm-hmm. Um which gets a little technical for today's mm-hmm. conversations, but um, those legal lobbyist efforts, you know, really curtailed the number of sinkhole mm-hmm. insurance mm-hmm. claims that got filed throughout the state. It doesn't mean that the geological conditions of our state changed at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. The problem never went away. Um, just the the funding of where the funds come for the repairs uh, shifted okay. onto the homeowners' earnest uh, mostly where we saw insurance companies pay for the repairs 10 years ago. Now homeowners are having to, to foot the bill I see. Uh, okay. for the majority of the, <clears throat> the repairs today, unless it's uh, catastrophic ground collapse, which we, we still see. That's a mandatory um, coverage. And, and there's, there's way that, that possibly, uh, if they're saying it does not meet that, possibly that could be challenged that no, that this is possible meets the catastrophic ground collapse or the, four, they have four criteria that we're going to engineering criteria. And it's very, um, leave some area for gray there. It's not very black and white opinion comes into it, yeah, uh, like, which is a never good thing in, um, in that situation. But nonetheless, there's still good for is the coverage. lawyers. That's where we, get, yeah, that's, that, that's where we get people paid. Yeah. <laughs> so there's, the there area. still is coverage for the catastrophic ground collapse and Helicon does. I mean, we're, we're still the, the largest sinkhole repair company in the state, even though that's not our, our big part of our business. Now, uh, it's more ground soil, soil improvement, ground improvement, soil stabilization, foundation repair, lifting and leveling of structures that are in place, both concrete, 
foundations, uh, stabling soil, stabilizing soil behind seawalls. But hey, you know, um, the good thing uh, too so. is since, <laughs> you know, a lot of these legislative changes too that, and you know more about this, well, we know, <clears throat> both know probably a lot about this, but you know, the technological advances in the method, you know, the methods that are used to stabilize uh, foundations and uh, keep the ground solid, you know, with the uh, use of like compaction, uh, chemical mm -hmm. grouting and things. Um, oftentimes, I think you guys can head off problems before they get worse. Oh, yeah. The the um, the repair solutions, uh, as we we've, we've mentioned on other, they're tried and proven. Mm -hmm. um, and that was where we talked about a, uh, a home that got repaired 30 years ago. It was a big stigma because people weren't sure that these repairs were going to hold. It was new technology. The technology is now proven. It's tried. It's true. Uh, Helicon, speaking on our behalf, we've had zero reoccurrence rates on warranty claims. Our competitors as well, I can, can't 100% uh, speak to their behalf, but I know their reoccurrence rates are also very, very low. So the... Um, the methods, uh, they're very regimented, very uh, strict prescription of the way the process is done. Uh, so the success rates are very, very good with the the repairs. Yeah, and oftentimes um, it's you know cheaper than doing like <clears throat> really deep helical pins and compaction grouting, and you know <laughs> sometimes with uh, uh, pins and grout, but you know chemical grouting and all the different things that are available now that maybe weren't available 20 years ago. Um, you know, people don't need to file claims to get a sturdy home if they call you think the repair protocol makes sense yeah. and yeah. they can look at the warranty right mm -hmm. it's usually a testament to you know the quality of potential work right that we'd be looking mm -hmm. at um and pre-construction yep. people do testing they put in a piling system or they treat the ground mm -hmm. do soil stabilization if they find clays or organics address the problem before it becomes a problem yeah, that's if huge. there is before you build um but yeah the, the laws have changed drastically um, one area that I'm curious, Grant, and I, and I think the homeowners are. Are you are, saying an ounce of caution is worth a pound of care? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My dad says. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. Spend <laughs> spend 2500 or 5000 on a, a soil study before building your you know, beautiful custom home and putting all this money in the foundation and uh, find out that settling later later on that you could have addressed it for a fraction of the cost now that the building's in place. It's a whole different uh, process and, and ball game. Um, but as far as um, we see that it's changed drastically on, on for homeowners, have things changed much on the commercial side that you've seen? Because I know you you represent both homeowners and and commercial. You don't just you know deal with just homeowners. Yeah. Um, has it changed much on? And from what I've been told, it's very it hasn't changed as well, much I mean, on all, the commercial and um, that side of things versus the uh, single family um, uh, policies. Well, I mean, you know, relative to residential and commercial, I mean, we're all still building on the same land, right? I mean, as far as the conditions uh, haven't the, changed, uh, the, the laws, the policy, the law <coughs> coverage. As far as, yeah, as far as insurance claims, <clears throat> there's a lot, um, a lot of different, you know, mechanisms that have been created by statute as well as incorporated into policies mm -hmm. uh, for homeowners and insurers to resolve any disputes that may exist them uh, exist between them. Uh, for example, um, arbitration. Uh, is becoming more popular in policies. Uh, appraisal uh, has become much more popular in policies, although I suspect that that's going to go away out of a lot of policies given the insurer's uh, recent lobbying efforts uh, last year. But um, they're going to try to force them back into litigation where they don't have the right of recovery of prevailing party fees. Um, but there's different things that, you know, have been done in, in that claim context Um to resolve those disputes. Um, another thing we're seeing a lot of with commercial versus residential are, and be careful of these, um, out of state venue selection clauses, out of state choice of uh, law, uh, mm -hmm. policy provisions mm -hmm. and things. And so it's really important on the front end to know what you're getting when you pay for it from your insurance agent. And if you have any questions about that, also call a law firm that specializes in first party property coverages, mm. uh, because you're going to pay them a lot of money. You better hope you got the coverage when you need it mm. um, so you can get the work okay. done the right way and not be, you know, in front of some New York panel in downtown mm -hmm. Manhattan where everyone charges eight hundred dollars an hour to work. Right. And good luck. 
yeah. beating your insurance carrier um, when they mm. stack the deck against you. Um, a lot of these policies yeah. say, mm -hmm. you know, in the, look in the back if you don't believe me, payment, like if there's a reached a written agreement between us or there's an entry of judgment against mm -hmm. the carrier. Well, you contemplated mm -hmm. litigation with me from the minute you sold me this policy. And almost every one of these carriers has claimed what we call work product, which means we anticipated litigation from the date mm -hmm. a claim is filed, mm -hmm. the first notice of loss. Um, so now, again, I'm a first party guy. I'm, you know, yeah. I've seen so much stuff <laughs> that, you know, so from what but I that's in policies. It says we don't have to pay you unless yeah. we can reach a written on agreement the or commercial... you're going to judge me. You beat me. Okay, well, now i got to go to New York <laughs> and talk about sinkholes. And New York's like. <laughs> so from what I hear you saying on the, the commercial apartment buildings, condos, mm -hmm. All policies aren't the same. No. no, no so no. some may have sinkhole coverage, some may not. Um, like the old sinkhole coverage from that's what I was been told. Oh, apartment buildings and commercial, they they all have the old sinkhole policy coverage. Um, so they're good if they have a subsidence sinkhole. It doesn't need to be cover collapse. But from what I hear from the technical expert, all policies not created equal. Look mm -hmm. into your policy. Make sure you have a good insurance agent uh, before you before you bind that. Yeah, that I think policy, we see we we'll, see more sinkhole uh, coverages sometimes in commercial contexts or condo contexts because you have a board spending other people's money mm -hmm. on the coverages. So they sometimes mm -hmm. buy better coverages. Uh, homeowners on fixed incomes and things and a lot of, you know, snowbirds and stuff, you know, maybe are a little more cognitive, you know, a little more um, yeah. careful in what they may or may not spend their money on and sinkhole coverage usually isn't cheap. Right. Um, so. Those are all things to evaluate uh, at the time that you're getting your coverage. In addition to, and this is important, um, other types of things that you're going to have real problems with later, like a 10,000 water cap. I mean, that's really not going to get you much when you have a, a real plumbing loss, a supply right. line leak, a, a break in the yeah. slab, which is oftentimes due to stabilization mm -hmm. issues. Um, yeah. You know, roofs, roof schedules. We're seeing carriers come out with these roof schedules. Um, and a matching, you know, things around the Florida matching statute. You know, uh, most homeowners want their, they have insurance because they're dependent on that if they have a loss, right? Um, and so that means getting your home usually back to the way it was before. So make sure your coverages are in place to do that in the event you have a loss. Mm -hmm. And so you're a million percent correct that the coverages vary by policy. And everybody needs to be careful and address that on the front end. Cause a lot of times I've seen people come to me and it's like too late, man, mm -hmm. you got 10 and water loss. I, you, you got a $4 million house that mm -hmm. flooded. Yeah. The, you know, That's sad, but 10,000 yeah. is not going to cover this one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, not when you're looking at the cost of replacing a kitchen or a bathroom, mm -hmm. you know, the expensive stuff. Yeah. Right. So speaking of the coverage, like how does insurance coverage differ for natural sinkholes versus ones caused by like human activities? And when I say that, I mean like plumbing or a pipe that bursts, um, like events like that. How does that differ, you would think? What's the question again? It was like, how does insurance coverage differ for natural sinkholes versus ones caused by human activities? I don't or, know that it but, differs. Yeah. There's different coverages. Like we see as first party uh, insurance attorneys, uh, vibration claims, guys, you know, drilling in like the bridge that went over to um, St. Pete Beach. You okay. know, there's a lot of multi-million dollar homes that got affected by um, the drilling, you know, relative to the installation of, of some crazy mm -hmm. infrastructure. Um, you know, vibration claims are different than a sinkhole. Again, I, it all comes back to the data. It comes back to the testing. Um, yeah. That's okay. causing. But if it was damage. a plumbing like you described, yeah. the washout and they're capped at 10 grand. You're capped at ten grand. Whether yeah, again, it goes a, back to the particular, a natural sinkhole and eroded out a big void underneath your house. It can happen. You're, you're capped at the ten thousand dollar because it was caused by a water. Definitely water factually dependent mm -hmm. uh, in light of what the policy yeah. language coverages are. Okay. Uh, so again, mm -hmm. having trained eyes that have dealt with yeah. it and are mm -hmm. are you know used to interpreting policy language and looking for coverage versus looking to not extend coverage, right, yeah. uh, is, is super important. And policies, you know, in general, uh, I don't know how many people watching this podcast have actually even read their full policy, you know, front to back. They're not written in the easiest way. So, you know, That's it's true. important to have guys that are used to seeing them and reading them and knowing the endorsements. And every carrier has their own, you know, mm -hmm. language in certain areas. 
Yeah, definitely. So in the event of a sinkhole happening, what steps should homeowners take to navigate the legal process from your perspective? Well, obviously, again, hiring uh, an attorney out of the gate is important. And most people are like, oh, an attorney this is going to, why would I do that? I don't want to spend money on something when I don't even know if I have a problem. Uh, there's many first party insurance attorneys uh, throughout the state of Florida that handle these claims on a contingency basis, meaning we only get paid if and when we're successful in challenging a coverage determination or your carrier's decision that it's only owed X and we think it's owed Y. Um, and so you're not out of pocket throughout the claims process. Okay. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what can a homeowner do to ensure that the insurance company's engineer is recommending the best methods possible and maybe not necessarily the most cost effective methods? Again, I think it's that taking a second look thing we were talking about earlier. Um, you know, having another set of eyes that aren't paid for by the insurance company, you mm -hmm. know, um, you know, review the data um, and then working in consult with contractors, right? That you might actually want to have do the work and say, okay, what do we think here? Are we going to get a warranty or not? You know, and making sure that the, um, you know, the key fits the lock. It's just important to always take that second look and come up with a plan that makes sense for you. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, what words of advice do you have for homeowners who do have a claim and file one on their own? Do you feel that they can do it alone or should they really have an attorney do it for them just to make sure they have it, you know, correct? It is imperative. If anyone's watched like Matlock and CSI or whatever these shows are, you know, anything you can say, <laughs> it's, it's the truth. And they'll lock you into EULs, recorded statements. They'll ask for uh, what they do. They're very common now, request for information. Uh, and all of these mm. things are designed to try to prove up that you didn't cooperate with the carrier, provide them what they needed to. You didn't provide them prompt notice. Well, you first saw a problem back at this point. Well, we didn't insure you back then. So, so sad, you know, type of thing. Um, mm. You know, being, being represented, you know, throughout the claims process is, in my opinion, something that's going to help you uh, not get wrongfully denied or underpaid. Okay. And like, what would represent, representation cost for people? Like, would it be like 10%, 20%? Like, it much? changes over time. Uh, well, it depends on the, on the case, right? Okay. Um, and, and each law firm probably has a factor into like the particular facts of a case, you know? Um, so I think it's negotiable uh, okay. with law firms, um, you know, in Florida contingencies are, you know, typically capped at 3340. Um, for fees for an attorney in the, you know, in, in that contingency based representation. Um, but again, that's negotiable. I mean, you got mm -hmm. a slam dunk case. I mean, I'm, I've done some for seven and a half, you know, I mean, cause you're like, wow, this carrier is really messing mm -hmm. up a claim on a $20 million building, <laughs> you know? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, it's gotta be fair. The, the objective is that, that the homeowners are, um, you know, getting what they should and, uh, It'll vary, but that 3340 is, is kind of the maximum. Um, it is somewhat okay. negotiable based on the yeah. facts of the case. Sinkhole cases, though, in particular, are extremely expensive um, from, a, from a law firm uh, standpoint of advancing the costs associated with the subsidence investigations, the engineers, Engineer. you know, and those sorts yep. of things, um, improving up, you know, money zone on something that was otherwise denied. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, obviously something's always better than nothing. So getting that free look and... Um, deciding whether you want to move forward to get something, you know, um, do it sooner than later. Mm -hmm. Cause there's been cases, you know, otherwise I thought it could have helped it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Homeowner yeah. screwed it up. Oh, sorry. You know, mm -hmm. No, you're good. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you can't just ignore them. <laughs> yeah. Know? And I think Grant mentioned a, a good point that it is negotiable. And, um, you know, as Grant mentioned, he likes to be, be fair and, uh, he's, uh, hard to find a fair attorney out there. Um, mm -hmm. He's somebody that I've sent my my friends and family to that have uh, taken care of not on sinkhole uh, stuff, but other other uh, certain property loss mm -hmm. um, that he came through and and definitely uh, did a phenomenal job for us. Yeah, that's great <clears throat> to know. Um, how do sinkhole disclosures work in real estate transactions? You would say are sellers required to disclose potential sinkhole risk to buyers? Absolutely. Uh, sellers are required to disclose, um, whether or not there's an own sinkhole, um, you know, whether claims been reported and if money is recovered, you know, on the mm -hmm. claim, uh, and it, there's serious penalties for those that don't. Um, so it's pretty, important. it's also <laughs> included usually with it as a separate uh, line item, we'll call it, 
on seller's disclosures uh, mm -hmm. in Florida with for residential are mandatory, but commercial they're not. So like, just beware out there, mm -hmm. you know, be careful. Yeah. So what's the benefit of hiring an attorney like yourself over a public adjuster to take care of your claim? Like well, what would be the difference? Under the new lay of the land uh, where attorney's fees prior to the end of last year in December, um, where they did a, an overhaul of the insurance industry in general, um, to the extent you proved up a carrier wrongfully denied or underpaid a claim, essentially beating that insurance company's decision. And there's some factors that go into it, but there's the ability to recover attorney's fees and costs on top of what the actual amount was out of the gate, Okay, you know, that we believe the disparity was owed to the homeowner. Um, since then, they've done away with that prevailing party attorney fee um, set up. And now there's ways to shift fees, but it doesn't, it's not triggered more or less right out of the gate. Um, there's some things that are beyond the uh, scope of this podcast, you know, that, that can be done, you know, once you're into the battle of if you have to go to litigation, uh, 90 days potentially. But um, now it's more of a direct percentage based recovery for attorneys fees on claims moving forward. And that's the same as public adjusters generally have always been. And so, you know, attorneys can see it all the way through. Uh, sometimes adjusters are good at setting up the claim, evaluating the damages, uh, presenting an argument to the carrier. But if they tell them to pound sand, where do they go? They come to mm -hmm. us. Right. So now you're putting percentages on top percentages <laughs> then that's the homeowner less. And so, um, you know, attorneys generally concede the claims through from A to Z and we can hire experts to evaluate a scope of repair for much less than what an applicable percentage recovery valuation of that would typically be. Um, so kind of mm -hmm. puts us on. You know, yeah. Kind of, kind of going to charge you the same thing. <laughs> yeah. What's someone that can march it all the way uh -huh. through or not? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Is one uh, once and you are, just because you're hiring an attorney, it's yeah. a big misconception, guys. You know, it's not like you're going to litigation, you're not showing up yeah. in court <laughs> right away, all that sort of thing. I mean, our law firms and and I actually have a DBA now for Craft Legal. I don't know how it's mm -hmm. up, but next step claim consultants. So many people are scared to hire a law firm to do something, and they shouldn't be because it doesn't mean we're going to litigation. We could still propose appraisal to have a claim resolved quickly, expediently, you know, out of court, you know, but if the carriers say name your appraiser and they don't name mm -hmm. their appraiser, whack them. You know, we can file the, the civil remedy notices, complaints if it's needed, right? Um, but there's kind of a hammer there um, and it expedites that process because we're the watchdogs of the insurance carriers. And, um, you know, that's important, you know, is to net the client as much as you possibly can. Right. Now, once I hire an attorney or even a public adjuster, my talking with dealing with keeping everything organized and managing the claim that shifts. I don't talk to the insurance company now. Yeah, you have, a, you have with, a professional. Yeah, you guys. So I don't have to spend my time. Um, that's why a lot of folks, I believe, especially busy professionals, um, not only for the expertise, but they just don't want to deal with the time that's involved. Is, is it a time consuming Anybody that's process? Had an insurance claim I mean, you have a whole team, a time you have a whole process, back end yeah. of a whole ad admin team that I, I assume manages all. It's typically a quick all. one uh, either. Um, so, so uh, you know, I think it is quicker when you go attorney direct uh, because it just is, right? Yeah. Um, and so uh, th there's immediate enforcement on, on breach issues and non-compliance issues. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, having professionals mm -hmm. handle the claim has been shown even by the state, I believe, to uh, you know, re recover mm -hmm. a lot more money mm -hmm. in the end. Because you mentioned depots and recordings and all these. Yeah, you, like you I, would stand by your client by their I side have during those costs things. Like when I, I mean, I do a lot of proprietary things. You know, like when we do reinspections, if you've got one of my clients, I've got videographers out there on the roof. You know, and they're can't ignore. It's all hard to ignore the damage. You got a videographer there. <laughs> That's you true. know, with an adjuster, a, a loss consultant, somebody there that is lifted, literally showing you the damage. You know, mm -hmm. um, and talking. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Did you look at that? Did you look at this flashing? Did you look at under the cabinet? Did you look in the attic? You know, look at the insulation. Are you seeing it? Is that mold? Is there mold in the drywall? What would your carrier do to adjust it? You know, yeah. really advocating from day yeah. one. I mean, mm -hmm. that that's how we've grown quickly as a firm is just through all that referral-based results-driven work. Um, 
holding them accountable, hold the feet to the fire from mm-hmm. day one. Um, I don't know about other firms. My firm, we're, we're more throw as much money at it to try to get it done as quick as possible, move on to the next max recovery, move on, mm-hmm. you know, as fast mm-hmm. as we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like word mm-hmm. of mouth. And yeah, before you know it, uh, yeah. I've never been an advertising mm-hmm. type of thing. I feel like that's, 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 that's cool. It's fun. <laughs> this is fun. Now you get invited on a cool show. <laughs> <laughs> See? Uh, how would you say sinkhole laws address situations where a property owner was unaware of a potential sinkhole risk at the time of purchase? And are there reparations for these individuals? Uh, so this question kind of revolves around uh, something that's not as insurance uh, oriented. Um, there's what's called a Johnson v. Davis claim. Um, and it's basically when a seller knows the material facts uh, that the home that the purchaser doesn't and those materially affect the value of the home. and They don't tell them. You can go back on okay. the seller. Um, the problem with that is sometimes is it worth it, right? Um, so just be careful. Again, there's a lot of bad actors out there. You got out-of-state mm-hmm. shell companies flipping homes. Um, do your inspections thoroughly. Um, while you may have a claim, one of the, my firm mottos is, and my wife hates this, but it's making the juice worth the squeeze, mm-hmm. right? We don't want to go down the road, especially on these contingency basis, without the juice being worth the squeeze. Uh, and that, you know, sometimes those Johnson B. Davis claims just aren't worth it. A lot of attorneys won't handle them on a contingency basis. So you're paying retainers to fight. Um, and so the answer is, yeah, there's remedies out there. Is the juice worth the squeeze? Again, you got to consult, consult with somebody. Uh, you know, we can always tell you if we think it is or not. All right, cool. That's good to know. And just because we may not think it's not worth the squeeze um, doesn't mean somebody else may not feel differently. That's true. Uh, could you maybe walk us through any of the challenges in accurately assessing the financial damages associated with sinkhole incidents? Well, it's a naturally occurring phenomenon, mm-hmm. right? So nature's wild and crazy and no one can control it. Um, and so, you know, it gets really hard to predict the future, uh, particularly with subsidence work, right? Mm-hmm. Cause you can't just see it. Now technology has come such a far away. Um, that our ability to, you know, establish protocols and repairs and things um, because of the data that we have has gotten much better. But it, it gets really hard to guarantee that anything in this world is going to work sometimes. So, um, yeah, I mean, the fact that it's below ground and it's constantly evolving, um, you have geological and weather features like hurricanes. I mean, we just had or in El Nino and mm-hmm. it's supposed to be a yeah. crazy hurricane <clears throat> season. But, yeah, surface floodwater issues. Um, you know, disparities in drought, like you were talking mm-hmm. about earlier, which affects the aquifer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all that sort of stuff, you know, is uh, more or less out of our hands. Uh, so we just do the best given the data that we can yeah, that's obtain. Like, yeah, the engineer, when you're saying assessing the financial damages, that the engineer could estimate the sinkhole repair is going to cost 100000 and it costs 200000 uh, We've seen swings. Uh, last year, we were doing the Deltona High School uh, sinkhole repair, believe the estimate was uh, around 700,000, 700, roughly, give or take. Um, we were going to be drilling down piers to 80 feet. They ended up going 160. It ended up going 100% over the estimate. Um, that was where we had to scam- scramble. And we have to get the job done by the end of summer, no matter what. So we had to scramble all sorts of resources that that Helicon has a, a huge back end of resources to tap into in cases like this. Um, so we were able to still get it done two weeks ahead of schedule. They opened up the, the school building and uh, hopefully we'll be out there again um, this coming summer uh, to do building number two of seven. We've also seen um, it. But, uh, but the swings are. It, we've yeah. seen it go the other way a lot too, man. Where it's oh, like, yeah, where oh, yeah. They estimate 150 and the job ends up being 50. Yeah, and that's um, why you got to go for the bat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Grant, okay. Grant's right. The technology yeah, yeah. has come a long way. They, release, they are, sure get, I'd know. say they're closer now within on the, the below ground sinkhole side. Um, can't speak as much to the above ground cosmetics, but I would think the cosmetics, if you get a really good estimate by a, you know, a, a competent uh, estimator, should be fairly close whereas the sinkhole there's a lot of unknowns you can't see anything with cosmetics you know how much paint you know how much drywall um you, you can get that down to a pretty good small ballpark where you're not going 100 percent over uh estimate or coming under 
uh, the, the it's uh, more the predictable. Yeah, you, just, you know, <laughs> yeah. you usually don't want to um, go with the cheapest quote, and you usually don't want to go with the highest. Yeah. Sometimes it depends on, you know, what you know, particular circumstance. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it's obviously a lot harder when you can't physically mm -hmm. see all the factors affecting it, like you can usually in the above ground damage mm -hmm. aspect of mm -hmm. it. Now, there's always disparity in arguments over what that reasonable cost is to fix anything, because different people give different bids based on what their crews are doing, this, that, and the other thing. But um, yeah, it's way harder when it's below ground. Oh yeah, it's always difficult. And as a final question, are there any misconceptions or myths about sinkhole law that you frequently encounter and how can these be clarified for the general public? We talked about that a little bit in the beginning, um, you know, minor differential settlement versus like cars and holes, right? Mm -hmm. um, the myth is that the geological conditions of the state of Florida uh, you know, are very prone to sinkholes and uh, they're occurring every day. And you know, the key is to be kind of vigilant, uh, you know, with pre-purchase inspection reports or foundation stabilization before you invest all the money into your your dream home or, or office um, to minimize the risks of damages. Um, I love that ounce of caution worth a pound of cure. Mm -hmm. It could be like a new yeah. slogan, slogan for y'all. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, yeah, just being vigilant on those ends and, you know, regularly looking at your property, inspecting it uh, for any signs of, of damage, subsidence problems, um, you know, and then promptly following through if you have insurance and you want to make a claim to get paid for it, you know, doing it quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Always uh, getting to the problem and with quickly can save, okay. can save not only time, but soon save uh, money as well. Mm -hmm. Money and headache for sure. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> okay. I really enjoyed, um, you know, y'all inviting me here. This is, like I said, the first time I've done anything <laughs> like it. So hopefully, yeah, uh, yeah we appreciate you. The audience being thinks here. it went well, and I'll hear from you <laughs> after, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> the critiques, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that wraps up our podcast. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel down below for more exciting content, and we will see you on the next one.